Okay, this is the fourth video. This is going to be a little bit of a longer one than the last few. And in this one I'm going to talk about a tweet that's become associated with my name uh, for a number of years now. Um, and this is something that occurred in the days following the shooting of um, Mr. Don Dunphy. So you might not know the full story of, of what happened to Don. I, I don't need to go into all the details, but I was among the first to point out that Mr. Dunphy's tweet had no threat in it, that when you read it in its full context, there was there was just no threat um, that would have required police intervention. So as I was doing this, uh, two RNC officers flagged me to every RNC officer and civilian associate and the premier security detail for my political views. Uh, I went on to be detained the next day for a tweet, which which will come up later. Um, but I was not provided with the opportunity to speak with a lawyer or a rights advisor. Uh, I was certified in the space of five minutes after two quick interviews. One lasted 30 seconds and the other about five minutes. I asked for a second opinion the next day and two other doctors reviewed the matter and signed me out six days later and they called the thing, the whole thing was just a political abuse of psychiatry. So the entire matter at the hospital was ruled unlawful in 2018. Uh, since then, the RNC have been investigating themselves, uh, including the officers that were involved. The main charges that they were examining would have uh, surrounded allegations of uh, perjury and falsification of evidence that came up during the Dunphy inquiry. Um, there were multiple instances of conflict where the RNC and the Justice Department had placed themselves in a position of conflict and were refusing to recuse themselves. And the final, final ruling on the officer facing charges of perjury came down just days before the election with no charges, everything, just, just no explanation given. So since no evidence has been offered as to why it isn't perjury, this is only one of the officers, they didn't say anything about the other one, so why it isn't perjury, and there's witness statements who are contradicting what the officer said sworn on, on public record on a freely accessible video, why is there no charges? So the only conclusion I can draw is that uh, our Attorney General Andrew Parsons is, is mucking about with the judicial system and the allegation Joe Smythe has made against him does hold some, some weight and some merit. So to provide some further context to the tweet before I get into all the details, um, I mentioned that like my political views were targeted. So going back to July of 2014, this is what they were talking about. Uh, I filed charges against Stephen Harper and John Baird for what I saw was a hate video that they'd created. Um, not many people have actually seen this video even today. It's still up on YouTube, but I think it's only got 70,000 views as of now. So I mean, like there's a lot of people in Canada haven't seen it. Uh, and it, it was aimed at an Israeli leadership. It wasn't aimed at a Canadian audience. Um, so, so anyways, I started a petition and I tried to file charges. I went to the RNC and I explained, you know, I saw this as propagating hate and it was something that should be condemned. And um, they passed it on to the RCMP. While this was going on, uh, the Israeli assault on Gaza began. Um, Actually, simultaneous with that, uh, a plane was downed over Ukraine. So while the world's attention was like looking at Ukraine and this downed plane and this, this pending war that was going on there, was Israel was assaulting Gaza. And it was almost like they were trying to use, uh, just make use of the fact that everybody was distracted. So in, in this video, we've got a, a Prime Minister of Canada who's advising the Israelis to confront the dark forces. And now this is a white man saying this to a mostly white audience, you know, confront the dark forces. And in his original speech that this is taken from, it's aimed at Iran, but now he's repurposed it to be aimed at Palestine. Uh, and if you look at other parts of that original speech and what made it into this propaganda video and the slices of it, I mean, it's, it's a really sophisticated form of hate speech. He's saying, the other hates you. You know, the other hates you. They hate everything you stand for. So obviously, it's not, it's not like I'm telling you to hate somebody, but I'm saying they hate you. They hate everything about you. So it becomes a form 
of hate speech, even though it's not a traditional form of hate speech, it's still a form of hate speech. And then he even throws in the idea that going along to get along is weak and wrong, which is pretty much the opposite of what the golden rule w w would be telling you in these situations, you know? So <sighs> to have somebody go there and to make this kind of video with the footage from that, that speech, it's, 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 it's really concerning. I flagged it. On, on top of that, right now, Israel is currently facing an ICC investigation for that, that entire event and things that have happened since because the settlement rate did escalate following, following 2014. Um, the investigations and a lot of the work the prosecutors were doing was suspended due to sanctions imposed by Trump because he didn't want Israel investigated and he didn't want them to investigate what uh, U.S. soldiers may or may not have done in Iran, uh, in, Iran in uh, Afghanistan. But if what happened in Israel and Gaza is a war crime, so what about the politicians who incited that level of violence, who, who went there and earlier in that year and advised them to abandon the peace process and seize the land that they needed? And then it escalated into this. Like, what about the politicians who actually incited that behavior? For like, forget about Trump inciting the Capitol riot. What about people inciting acts of genocide? Like, why don't we call that out too? We can't, we can't say we're going to condemn Trump and not also condemn the people in our own country who've done it in the past as well. Because Canada ultimately, like when you talk about the International Criminal Court, Israel isn't party to the International Criminal Court. They never signed the Rome Statute that actually gives the court jurisdiction over their country. The United States isn't part of the International Criminal Court. Same idea. They never gave them jurisdiction. They never... Canada, though, Canada fully is. Palestine is questionable because they are considered a sovereign state by the UN, but they're not, you know, some nations don't recognize this. But Canada, the nation that incited this violence, is fully ratified. We're fully part of that. So you've got Canadian politicians who incited the violence... They produce a hate propaganda video with public funds. And the unrest that surrounds the treatment of the Palestinians actually incites a whole new generation of radicalized Muslims. And then you're seeing the rise in ISIS and all everything that came with that. So when I talk about my political views, I see like a lack of respect for the human rights of the Palestinians was a major moral failing of, of just Canadians at large and the Canadian government. Like we just, we just, we dropped the ball there. So eventually the charges were dismissed by the RCMP. I think it took about two weeks. And uh, I filed a public complaint alleging failure to properly investigate the matter. Uh, the public complaints compartment was, uh, was closed before the complaint was completed and it became a private complaints department so I could no longer have a public hearing of the matter. And the final report on the complaint indicated that the charges that I'd filed were viewed as a threat to national security, and they went through, um, anyways, they went through a national security vetting process, threat vetting process. So while this is going on, I continued campaigning to get recognition of the matter. The petition still exists. It's seven years running. I still periodically update it, although it's not as thorough as it should be anymore. Um, there's other issues that arose during this time, including Section 13 of the Human Rights Act. And that was, that was repealed in 2013 by the Conservatives and uh, came into force in 2014. And that was when, like me personally, I started seeing a rise in alt-right and the far right and the extremist right, you know, like the Proud Boys and the, the Nazis starting to rise up online more. I was seeing more of this activity on Twitter and I started I started flagging that but it was at the time I was just seeing as oh you're just that's that's crazy. You know, who talks about Nazis anymore? But like that was our government giving them a space to talk where they could speak freely. You know, they, they opened the door into Canada and said, Come in, you know, hate speech is fine here. We don't have any law that regulates it anymore. The only person that actually has power over that is the attorney general because ultimately if you're creating hate propaganda the attorney general is the one who has to consent to all prosecution like you can look it up look look up our Canada's hate propaganda laws and you'll see consent clauses there 
that's saying, you know, the attorney general has to consent to prosecution on this. So the attorney general gets to decide whether or not something is considered hate or not. So I realize this could create a conflict. So if a corrupt attorney general was paired with a hateful prime minister and probably a good few corrupt public servants, um, you could circumvent the law by just having the attorney general refuse to proceed on charges. Like if somebody ever brought the charges to the attorney general, they could say, well, I'm not going to consent to that and just dismiss it. So I filed a charter challenge in December of 2014 to challenge the consent provisions of the criminal code uh, pertaining to genocide in specific. Uh, I'm just reading off notes here, so I'm sorry if I'm a little distracted. I'm trying to remember everything in a specific timeline. So the first appearance for that was in January, and the judge forced service on the respondents. And the second hearing was scheduled for April 10th. Now, I was detained three days prior to this and denied the right to appear by a loophole in the law. So going back to the tweet, to understand my tweet, you have to understand that as far as I was concerned, Don Dunphy's tweet was basically a prayer, a one he'd been shot dead for. So I'm paraphrasing, but he asked politicians to open their eyes and see the suffering around them. He hoped that God was judging them for their actions and surmised that he'd already passed judgment on two of them who had died. He didn't want to name them out of respect for their families. So he, and that's again paraphrased, he sent that on Good Friday. You can't look up his profile anymore because it's been deleted, but he called himself a crucified injured worker. And he had a worker injury from decades ago that left him in chronic pain and he was basically crippled, not completely crippled from the waist down, but he was, he was in a lot of, it was difficult. I didn't know him personally, I just I know of his story after the fact. But Easter Sunday, after his dinner, a plainclothes police officer arrives by himself to acquire about this tweet that he sent on, on Good Friday. And in the space of minutes, Dunphy's shot dead. And then you've got the police coming out and saying that Dunphy was mentally ill, that he was threatening the premier, and that he pulled a long gun. This man who, who has a chair that helps lift him upright because it's difficult for him to stand up on his own. He, he pulled a a gun out of nowhere as the officer was taking notes. So I, I see the absence of a threat in this tweet. Like to me, I'm seeing like he, he's praying to God that, that, that God's judging politicians. But before a full investigation is completed, the premier is coming out and telling the media that his family shouldn't be threatened just because he stepped up for politics. And he's completely ignoring the content of Dunphy's actual words. He went on to say they were going to tighten the monitoring of social media. So me, knowing Dunphy's tweet should have been protected by both freedom of expression and freedom of religion, that, that bothered me the most. It screamed police state to me <laughs> uh, that you couldn't even pray that God was judging politicians. So. And just, just quickly, my beliefs, like I, I, I believe in God, like I've, I've studied the Bible and the Quran, and I've, I've read other holy texts and I've looked into ancient cultures and religions. And I don't believe God is someone up in heaven sitting on a throne. Uh, I believe heaven is here. Uh, and that when in, in the Bible, like when they talked about the hereafter as some magical place, they were talking about the future. So the here, but later, which is kind of now. And that in more modern terminology, like our ancient prophets were just psychics that were focused on seeing this hereafter, this glorious future that we were all going to stumble into someday. And they were just comparing notes across generations on how we eventually got there. And they, they were just the people with very limited vocabulary to describe what they were seeing. But I also believe that all events predicted will eventually come to pass, including this sort of final kingdom or golden age that we're, we're supposedly moving towards. Which brings me to my tweet. So Dunphy's tweet was both a prayer and words of dissent. 
My words were constructed in a similar fashion, and but they were meant as a rhetorical statement. So the desire that God judge those in power who've led people to ruin, it's a common theme in the Bible. Most important is a few end time figures who are to be judged before the final kingdom. And there's two specific ones whose actions corrupt the world. And then there's reference to them through all the prophets, all those psychics. They're all talking about it throughout the Bible. Daniel, Jesus, John. There's, there's, it's just all over the place. They're called antichrists or sons of perdition, lawless ones. And the final word on them comes from John of Patmos in the book of Revelations. So in Revelations 19.20, he wrote, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So this is in the chronology of Revelation. It occurs before the final kingdom. You know, like there's like a, a reckoning and a cleaning out before that actually happens. But this is also like literally a death sentence in the Bible. So like, God believes in capital punishment for corrupt politicians, whether the politicians believe in it or not. So part two of the tweet. Um, Aside from the two leaders who lead the world astray, there's also the, the, this idea of an unholy kingdom uh, or, or a nation led by hypocrites. And, I mean, it's described multiple ways. Like, it's got ten toes, five of clay, and five of iron, and ten crowns under a single crown. And that's probably the easier, easier descriptor to, to latch onto there, because one nation in the world has matched that description since 1949. And that, that's a year after Israel was founded. So, like, Canada has ten provincial crowns under a single federal crown. So since 1949, we've actually been, we've been in that potential category of an unholy kingdom. And when you look at it, like, we preach human rights, but we make tanks for human rights abusers. We're still engaged in genocide against the indigenous population of this country. We meet, like, we meet the criteria for an unholy nation of hypocrites. We're, we're nothing of what we pretend to be, or our country markets itself as. It might seem more welcoming, but it's not actually real. So the tweet. Yeah. As a Christian, I have every desire to see God's justice replace the corruption and injustice that plagues the world today. And I want to see the Confederation of Canada, as it exists, brought down and replaced with a more just and equitable system. The current one is built on racism, inhumanity, and genocide. And I want to see the politicians who brought the world to the brink of ruin executed, as per God's will. So in response to the Premier's comments about the shooting death of a poor, elderly, disabled man for praying publicly on Twitter, I said, How about this, Premier of Anel? I'm going to bring down confederation and have politicians executed. Ready to have me shot, coward? Those are my words, as I meant them, with the proper context. These are the beliefs that I was detained for. I still believe them. The Confederation of Canada is an unholy union. Colonialism is white supremacy. Canadian treatment of the indigenous is ongoing genocide. And two politicians in the world, one who opened the door to hate speech and the other who created a hateful cause to rally them around, have a death sentence on their heads you can find in the Bible. But in the words of Don Dunphy, I won't name names because it might hurt families. <laughs>